Thank you uh, to Dr. Boutros and Dr. Truitt for inviting me to speak. I have no disclosures. Um, antibiotics have been essential, even mandatory, for the management of diverticulitis until recently. Uh, and the question has come up as to how useful they are is because our, our understanding of the pathogenesis of diverticular disease has changed. Most of us learn in medical school that uh, people develop diverticulum, they develop a perforation, pericolonic inflammation, but now we understand that actually the pathogenesis of disease is actually quite complex and invo uh, involves a number of different factors, including um, the body's inflammatory response, the gut microbiome, and is related to a number of epigenetic factors. And I think that's, this is the secret sauce is, that's going to explain a little bit of what Dr. Flum mentioned earlier about the rising incidence of disease um, uh, and our different surgical response to it. Um, are antibiotics necessary for the management of diverticulitis? Well, that kind of depends on the context, really. So um, we're going to skip diverticulosis because there's really no evidence um, to suggest that um, antibiotics impact that disease process either way. But I think in acute diverticulitis, uh, it really does depend on what type of presentation it is. Uh, and then we have this other issue of sy symptomatic, uncomplicated diverticular disease that we're going to dig into at the end. So this field really got its genesis um, in about 2007 with the publication of a couple of um, retrospective cohort studies that looked at a group of patients um, who uh, either had antibiotics for diverticular disease or did not. And both of those small studies uh, done in Europe demonstrated no difference uh, between the antibiotic and observation groups. The trouble with these studies is that they're full of selection bias. Really, the treating surgeon decided whether the patient needed antibiotics. Uh, they decided the duration of the course of antibiotics. And so we really, only thing we can conclude is that in carefully selected patients who look okay um, might be candidates for treatment without antibiotic uh, therapy. The first serious attempt at studying uh, this problem was the AVOD trial. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to read this uh, in Swedish. Um, but this was a multi-centered randomized control trial uh, that uh, randomized 623 patients all of whom were admitted to the hospital. What's important to note about the study is they all had CT confirmed uncomplicated diverticulitis. Any patient that had complicated diverticulitis, including an abscess, any sign of an abscess was excluded. Another thing to note is that more patients with, there were more patients with recurrent diverticulitis in the no antibiotic uh, group, 44 versus 35%. So both groups were, uh, or the groups were randomized to just IV fluids or IV fluids and antibiotics for seven days. Another tr troublesome aspect of the study is that there wasn't really a standard antibiotic regimen that was left up to the discretion of the treating surgeon. So what are the results? Well, um, these authors were really able to demonstrate that there is actually no difference between the gr uh, two groups in terms of the pain scores, uh, temperature curve or the tenderness score um, fall in the admission. And then when they followed the patients out to one year, there was really no difference in length of stay, progression to surgical intervention, or recurrence. The next study, which has already been mentioned by a couple of the other speakers, um, is the Diabolo uh, trial, which is the diverticulitis antibiotics or close observation trial, which is a multicentral trial done in Europe, enrolled 528 patients. And in this trial, um, Dr. Bellman, who will be speaking next, is one of the co-authors. This trial enrolled um, CT-confirmed cases of diverticulitis. And all of these were Hinchy 1A, and there was a small proportion of Hinchy 1B patients, patients who had abscesses. And actually, they allowed folks up to abscess of five centimeters, which I'm not sure I would have um, done, uh, to be randomized into the no antibiotic group. 
And so the two groups were observation uh, with just IV fluids and Tylenol versus 10 days of antibiotics. Important to note that 13% of the observation group was treated, um, were treated as outpatients. Their primary outcome was time to recovery. Uh, and this was done as sort of a, a non-inferiority analysis um, uh, as, uh, for their power calculation. Recovery was def defined as discharge from the hospital, being able to eat a normal diet, uh, absence of a fever, a low pain score, and ability to resume uh, daily activities. They also looked at a number of secondary endpoints, uh, including days out of the hospital over that six month period, readmission, recurrence or persistence, incidence of complicated disease, need for colectomy, adverse events, and mortality. So this is the um, primary outcome. Uh, and you can see that there's actually no difference between the observation group and the antibiotic group. Here we have the secondary outcomes. And you really, uh, this is uh, not a very good slide, but it's really just intended to show that there's actually no difference in any of the secondary outcomes except to note, and this was noted in the AVOD trial, for all the negative um, outcomes, so colectomy, everything else, nothing was statistically, uh, statistically different, but those negative outcomes were all higher in the, in the no antibiotic group. So the percentages are all higher in the patients who were not treated with antibiotics. That's important because this study is not powered to look at these outcomes. And so we might have a big type two error here. Nevertheless, uh, these authors uh, concluded that there's really no difference in success rate, abdominal pain, complications, recurrence, need for colectomy. So uh, from what I hear, I wasn't at the consensus um, uh, meeting yesterday, but it sounds like nobody's convinced that uh, patients should go without antibiotics. Um, but um, one of the major um, criticisms uh, of both of these studies is most of the patients were treated as inpatients. This is a nice um, prospective cohort study that looked at 150 patients with CT confirmed diverticulitis who were all treated as outpatients with oral hydration and Tylenol. 98% of those folks got better uh, and only a small percentage required admission for IV antibiotics. None of these patients required surgery. So assuming that we, we can treat patients um, as outpatients without antibiotics, but that we don't agree that that's a reasonable course, if you're going to treat your patients with antibiotics, how long should you do it for? Everybody here has been told seven to 14 days, seven to 10 days. What's the evidence for that really? Nobody knows. This is a randomized trial comparing 123 patients with uncomplicated diverticulitis, and they were randomized to a four versus seven day course of antibiotics, and they were randomized on day four of treatment. The main outcome was again, successful treatment, absence of fever, white count, abdominal complaints, antibiotics, et cetera. Again, we see here that there's actually no difference between the patients that were treated longer um, or the patients that were treated for a shorter period of time. But of course, the longer course group had a longer hospitalization because they needed to stay in the hospital to get IV antibiotics. So there does actually seem to be some, some support for shorter um, treatment periods. So what about this um, syndrome of SUD? So despite the, um, the presentation given by Dr. Flum, I'm seeing a lot of patients in my office with this uh, symptomatic and complicated diverticular disease. These are folks who have been treated with successful medical management um, for their initial episode, but they come back months and years later with this persistent left lower quadrant pain you scan them, the CT scan is normal, you just see some diverticulosis. And the idea is that their initial episode has caused some form of inflammation and changes in the enteric wall leading to visceral hypersensitivity. 
And we do have some data that actually these folks are, have about a five-fold risk of progressing on to IBS-like symptoms. There are a number of emerging medical treatments. I'm going to talk about rifaximin, which is a um, non-absorbed um, GI-acting antibiotic. Um, there's four randomized trials um, that combine rifaximin with fiber. And all of these trials, um, all of them done in Europe, by the way, showed a reduction in the global symptomatic GI score. There's not really much uh, evidence for the use of mesalamine or probiotics. Another thing to think about is when we ask these patients to wait for surgery, what happens? This is the direct trial. This is a trial that randomized folks with three attacks of uncomplicated diverticulitis or one attack with persistent symptoms. Um, and it randomized this group to uh, watch and wait approach or surgery. And their main outcome was the GI quality of life index. So they had 109 in the surgery group and 56 in the non-operative management group. And what's notable about this study is even with a 15% anastomotic leak rate, which most of us would find completely unacceptable, the surgery group still had higher quality of life scores. And what's more, about 25% of the people who were randomized to the non-operative group came back within a year to have their, their colon out. So, the role of antibiotics uh, in uh, diverticular disease is an open question. I, it really depends on whether this is a complicated acute presentation or whether it's a long-term, low-grade symptom uh, sort of presentation. It appears that patients with uncomplicated disease can be treated safely with close observation. Uh, there is some uh, evidence that shorter courses of antibiotics may be equivalent to longer treatment. And then the biggest message is that none of the data that we have applies to any patient with complicated disease. And so in that way, I think the conclusions that you reached yesterday uh, are probably appropriate. Thank you.